If you got caught up in all the excitement and bought a Mitutoyo five times microscope objective, and it's been sitting on your desk for three days, and you've been gazing at it, wondering what you do with it, this video is for you. When I started talking about these Mitutoyo objectives that Jeff over at Light Glass Optics was selling at a discount, I had no idea that so many of you would actually buy one of these fantastic objectives never having used an objective before, but it turns out that several of you have. Have you ever bought a smart television and only to realize that you weren't smart enough to use it and the only document that made any sense in the box was the quick start guide? This is a quick start guide to your Mitu Toyo if you just bought one and don't know what to do with it. So in the next half hour, we'll cover the, the camera, the lens, the lighting, a platform to shoot on a way to hold a specimen, and uh, everything you need to know to go from zero to 100 in 30 minutes. A huge thank you to my Patreon supporters. Without you, I couldn't do this. Today, quite a bit of the equipment that I'm gonna be showing you is stuff that your dollars have made possible. Got a couple of new flashes coming this week that are also uh, donated by you guys, and I really appreciate it. Thanks also to the people who donate through the website. Your help is much appreciated. So what we're gonna do is walk through the entire setup, literally everything you need to know and everything you need to have on hand to take that Mitutoyo objective, hook it up to a camera and start taking pictures right away. I strongly suspect that anybody who's been doing photography for any amount of time is gonna have most, if not all, of what you're gonna need to, to get this done. But just in case you don't, I'll put some links in the show notes so that you'll know exactly what it is that uh, I'm talking about and where to find it and how to get the best price on it. So we've got a lot to cover, let's get on with it. If you want to see detailed how-tos on any part of this, you can find the videos on my website. That's uh, www.alanwallsphotography.com and go to the articles and videos page. It's searchable. Type in your keywords for what you're looking for and it'll bring up all my videos on that subject. And I have done videos on all of this in, in very, very, uh, a fine detail. This isn't going to be like that. I'm going to make a couple of assumptions as we get started. The first one is that you own a camera that has interchangeable lenses. What we need to accomplish is we need to find a way to connect the objective to our camera. But because of the optics in an infinity corrected objective, that has to be in a very specific way and it has to include an additional lens. When you're using an infinity corrected objective, you won't be able to see, well, that's not strictly true. You will be able to see a picture, but you won't see a proper well-focused image unless you have a relay lens. A relay lens is a tube lens. In a microscope, it's the bit between where you look in the hole and the objective at the bottom. There's a lens in the middle there inside the tube and what that does is it takes the light coming from the objective and focuses it onto the sensor. And you need that to take pictures. Now, there are many different ways you can go about doing that. There are all kinds of different tube lenses that you can use. Now, I have multiple videos on how to use this particular lens as a tube lens. It's my favorite. It's what I use every day is a Raynox DCR 150 a 208 millimeter uh, lens that works perfectly as a relay lens for this objective. But in thinking about it, I am guessing that more of you have a 200 millimeter lens than have a Raynox. I might be wrong, but I'm, I'm going to assume that a fair number of, of the folks that uh, have, have the confidence to buy a, a, a a microscope objective never having used one, probably already do a fair bit of photography and probably have 70 to 200 of some kind sitting around. So we need to have a way then to attach the objective to the lens. Fortunately, because we're using 
the lens as a lens, uh, we don't need anything else. You don't need any bellows or extension tubes. Whereas if you were using the Raynox as your relay lens, you would need a set of extension tubes uh, that would um, uh, separate the camera from the relay lens. All right, once you have that assembled, you have your objective on your camera, you're gonna have to have a way to focus. Now, you ca cannot take just a single photograph with one of these objectives because your depth of field is about 30,000th. <laughs> Let me try that again. Your depth of field is about 30,000th of a millimeter. That's very, very small. It means that you aren't going to get the eye of a fly in focus. You're going to get a tiny sliver of the eye, a little disc of the eye will be in focus. So there's no such thing really as taking single shot photographs with a 5x objective. Um, having said that, I'm sure somebody takes very good single shot photographs with it, but not me. What we're going to be talking about is focus stacking. So we have to have a way to focus the lens as we move through the subject. I assume you know what focus stacking is. If you don't, so we need a way to focus. Now, there are two ways that we can focus when we're focus stacking. Three ways, actually. Four ways. There's a lot of different ways we can focus when we're focus stacking. If we're going to be using a lens, though, um, there are three ways that pop to mind. The first is to, with the lens and the camera together as a unit, is move them back and forth, or actually just move them in one direction in tiny increments, which means we would need some kind of a rail to do that. So we either need a focusing rail or we need a way to focus the lens itself. Now, there are a couple of ways you can do that. You can get a large um, videography focusing wheel, a focus follow wheel, something like that, that has incremental uh, markings on it. And you can actually make very, very small incremental changes in the focus using one of those. It's very, very tedious. I've done it. it a stack takes forever to do. Uh, probably a better option is to go with an electronic solution like Helicon makes a, a, a focusing system that will take control of your lens in autofocus and it will uh, advance the lens in tiny, tiny increments to do your focus stacking for you. Some cameras have a focus stacking capacity like my D850, but it, it doesn't stack at this kind of level. It doesn't, the increments don't get that short and they have to be very, very short. Without getting into the calculations or uh, the, the theory behind it, depth of field is a very subjective thing, but in order to get pictures that are gonna look like there are no gaps in the focus, you probably need to be looking at a step length of about 20 microns to be on the safe side. You could probably get away with a bit longer, but 20 microns is 0 0.02 millimeters. That's, that's not very much. That means there would be 50 of those in one millimeter. And you, you can't manually turn a knob 50 times to get one millimeter of turn. We don't, we don't have that fine control of the stuff. So we need a better way to do it. Electronically, like I say, with the Helicon devices, one way, but probably the easier way is to just use a focus rail. So we have a way to attach the objective. We have a way to focus. We then need a way to light our subject. And I'll, I'll give you some important pointers on things to do, things not to do and the equipment that you'll need. That's about it. If you, can, if you can keep your camera and lens completely still and resist moving your subject between shots, then you can take fantastic pictures with what I'm getting ready to show you. Okay, so let's begin the show and tell.
When you're taking photographs at five times magnification and above, there is one thing that will ruin your photographs every single time. And it can be incredibly frustrating and hard to nail down, but it's vibration. If your system is vibrating, especially if your camera and your subject are vibrating out of phase, it doesn't really make any difference. If they're vibrating at all, you're not gonna get sharp pictures. Dampening or killing vibration is job number one, and you have to take care of that. If you don't, if you just try sticking this stuff on a tripod, pointing at it, a tiny thing and taking pictures, forget about it. They're not gonna be any good. It's, it just doesn't work that way. You can get away with that with a macro lens. You can't get away with that with an objective. So let me show you what I would suggest as the quickest, easiest way to be shooting. Go and find yourself two pieces of wood. Uh, this one is a couple of feet long, maybe nine, 10 inches wide. Uh, it's actually a sandwich of several pieces of plywood because that's all I had. It doesn't really matter. Just a piece of wood about that size. Then a bigger piece of wood, preferably something uh, hard. This is pine and it's, it's not the right choice. You can see the holes in there. I'll explain where they come from in a minute. But if you can get a piece of wood this size, I'm guessing it's what, two and a half feet long and a foot wide, something like that. Uh, and fairly solid, about that thick, and put four rubber feet on it. You can buy these at the hardware shop and you just screw them into the wood. This is gonna be important because of how we're gonna do our lighting. Now, the second thing you need is this other piece of wood. You have to do this in the right order. You're going to be use. let's say you're gonna be using a focusing rail rather than uh, an electronic focusing device. And I'm definitely assuming that you don't have a, a, uh, an automated focusing rail. So you're gonna use a manual rail. You can use the Manfrotto 454, which uh, is, is a nice little rail. Uh, there are several other um, affordable, decent rails. I reviewed this one, the, the Nisi, um, the uh, MN, NM, NM 180. It's, it's really nice and it has a feature on it that the other rails don't have that is super important. This thing rotates, uh, which means that if I'm using my camera, I can have it in one or orientation, but if I'm using it with my lens, uh, I can turn it the other way and, and have everything lined up straight. Uh, this is just a nice, well-made, easy to use rail. And I did a video on indexing using this little knob to where you can actually use this rail at something like two, or is it four, 10 micron steps. So you can definitely do a complete focus stacking uh, job with this rail. Uh, and it's a fraction of the price of, of a stack shot or something like that. You can't have it sitting on the piece of wood though, because the button, the knob won't turn and you don't want it all the way down there anyway. You want it a little bit off the ground. So what I use is one of these doodads. This is a Z lifter or something like that. It's got a Z in it somewhere. It, it's friction operated, meaning you can, you can bend it into, into shape. I don't like it for that reason. I don't like anything friction set. I mean, I like to be able to set it and lock it. Um, so when I use this, I have an Allen wrench and I keep everything really, really tight. But this actually works brilliantly for this application. It's got a couple of holes in the bottom. So what you need to do, this is so important, Me measure, the width of your piece of wood and find the midline, mark it in several different places, and then draw a heavy line right down the middle. And you're gonna use that as your center line for everything. That's important, very important. If you start taking photographs of something that is off center and you're moving your camera a, few, a millimeter off to the side, what's gonna happen is every time you move your camera, the outline 
of your subject is going to change as you get closer to it. You know, you walk past the building, the outline of the building changes. And that's what the camera is seeing too. So if you're going past your subject, then your stacking program is going to run into problems aligning the images. So it's super important that you line your specimen up with the optical axis of your camera and lens. It's probably less important with something like the this 70 to 200 that has a large um, pupil. It allows you to get away with being a little bit off. I said I wasn't going to do any theory, didn't I? Okay, forget that. Forget that. Just get your screwdriver instead. Before you can attach anything, you need to take the second piece of wood, the top one. You need to take your electric drill. If you don't have an electric drill, they make one with a crank handle on it. If you don't have one of those, you can use a piece of string. I've seen that done as well. I should stick to the topic, right? Okay, fair enough. So what you need to do is decide how am I going to attach this to this piece of wood from the underside? Right. Well, this is actually the attachment that I use for my uh, stack shot, but it happens to work perfectly for this too. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use this hole and this notch, the notch to hold the thing straight and the hole to attach it to the board. So I ha already have the holes, but if you didn't have the holes, this is when you would now drill them. I would take a pencil, put it through the hole you're going to use, and then however you want to attach it, put some marks on the wood, take your drill bit, drill holes through it, and then take some bolts like these ones. These are nice stainless steel bolts because I don't want to hurt my nice stack shot. So I use very high quality uh, stainless steel uh, bolts to, to fix it to the platform. Even though this is just a temporary platform while my, my new creation, the cage project is, is getting underway, I still want, I still want it to be as, as uh, accurate as possible. Remembering that this is the bottom, you'll put your, your bolts through depending on what you're attaching to it. And then <clears throat> you can flip it over, position your device, so it's screwing on to, to this one, and this one is just sitting there passively. I may put a, um, in fact, I will put a spacer around this bottom screw to jam fit it straight. All right, then I'll use my uh, screwdriver. This is a screwdriver. If not, it's, uh, it's a drill, but it works like a screwdriver in the hands of an artisan like me it does anyway <laughs> it's going backwards all right that's on that that's not going anywhere and it's absolutely on your center line that's important now we can attach the rail make sure this is flat get a spirit level um, a little camera spirit level is fine or a regular one and make sure this is flat. Just like if you're going past your subject, you also don't want to be going down in front of it or up above it. You want to be flat and level. Take your rail and then however you want to attach it with a quick release plate or anything that you have handy. If you're using a, a piece of uh, I almost said a bad word. If you're using a piece of equipment like this, it's not really equipment, but you could just bolt this straight onto the wood and it will be ready to roll. But they're hard to use. I focus stacked with this for 10 years before I <coughs> bought a decent focusing rail. So they, they do work. You can use them. They're just pretty rubbish. All right, so then you take your, your rail, and uh, it has a screw hole in the bottom. Unfortunately, and it's one of the design problems with the, the Nisi rail, one of the things, one of the few things about it that I don't like, it only has one point of attachment. Something like this should have two points of attachment so that it cannot turn, especially when it's got a handle that you're 
that you might be using to, to move it. That's just begging for the thing to rotate. Uh, it has a couple of little um, uh, stops on the bottom, screw stops. So it wouldn't be a big deal to take this and put it on a, an additional rail to, to secure it. How you do this doesn't really matter. What matters is that this thing is not moving. When you get through, this puppy is staying right where you put it. That's important. Then what you're gonna do is take your, your screw thing, your screwdriver and turn it into a drill. Don't know how you do that. It becomes, a, there's a button you press. But once you have a drill bit on here, you need to secure your little bit of wood to your big bit of wood. There's a, there's a thing you have to do with the screw holes called countersinking. That's where you just, there's a thing that you put on your drill and it cuts a little hole so the head of the screw is recessed into the wood. You need to do that so this will lie flat on your bigger piece of wood. Drill six holes, eight holes, 14 holes, just so long as it doesn't move, two holes if you want. And then put your screws through the wood into the bottom wood. Don't make them so long that they go through both pieces of wood into your dining room table. Hey, I've done that before. That's your platform now set up. And you have now a stable platform from which to do your focus stacking. You're going to need a camera, DSLR, mirrorless, doesn't matter. Um, and a lens, 200 millimeter is important. It has to be a 200 millimeter lens. If you're using a zoom lens, you want that lens to be 200 millimeters when it's all the way. You don't want a 70 to 300 millimeters at 200 millimeters. To attach the lens to your camera, you attach your lens to your camera. If you didn't have this 200 millimeter lens, you would be attaching your extension tubes or your bellows to the camera. I'm lining up my, my uh, tripod mount because I'm gonna be using the tripod mount and I want it to be squared up. All right, before you attach the objective, um, turn off everything. So you want your autofocus off, you want your vibration control off. Okay, that's just standard for putting a camera on a tripod. Now, what we're going to do just for demonstration purposes is go ahead and mount the... See how, see how this thing is not holding the weight? That's one of the reasons I, I'm, I'm not crazy about using the Z-Lifts. The one that I'm gonna link down below in the show notes is new and it is uh, several orders of magnitude more capable than this. That's right in the middle of the rail. For those of you who are viewing this from above, which is all of you, that's what we've got so far. We have a 200 millimeter lens on the camera and uh, the uh, tripod mount of the lens is on the Nisi focusing rail. This piece of wood, of course, is not moving around because it's bolted to the bottom piece of wood. This is now completely flat and completely straight. This is how we're gonna use it to shoot with. Now, we need to attach the objective to the front of the relay lens, but before we do so, we don't forget, set your zoom to 200. You want to be at 200 millimeters, the full extent of this lens, then focus the lens at infinity. That is what the lens is going to think it is seeing. The light that's coming out of that objective is a series of parallel rays of light, all traveling in a bundle. That is what the lens sees when it's looking at something very far away. So that's what the lens is going to interpret is that the light coming out of this objective is far distant, at infinity. And it will then focus that light onto the sensor just the way we want it. So set your focus to infinity. When you're doing photography at this kind of magnification, there is no recipe. It, it changes your, from shot to shot or from, from composition to composition. 
What's going to get you the best picture changes depending on your lighting, the reflectivity of your subject, the ambient light, whatever's going on. So I'm going to show you the best starting place in my opinion. And I'll tell you what you might want to do to adjust that as you go. But don't, don't take this as being, this is the only way to do it. That is not my intention at all. If you've watched any of my videos, you'll know there are a hundred ways of doing everything. And the best macro photographers know all of them and know when to use which of them. That's the key. There is an adapter that you can buy. I'm assuming now that your lens is a pretty standard 70 to 200 and it has a 77 uh, millimeter uh, filter thread, you can buy an adapter that has a metric 26 millimeter hole in the middle with a 0.7 thread that is designed for this objective. But I don't recommend you use it. When you put it on the lens, the butt of the objective, the, the brass piece at the, at the very end is less than a millimeter from, from impacting the front of your lens. There's nothing wrong with that because it is separated from the lens. But in my experience, if you have any circumstance where you're taking your photographs where, where there's a lot of off-axis light, you are prone to get internal reflections bouncing back and forth between the objective and the lens, which causes softening um, it lowers image quality, it reduces contrast. I don't like it. I don't like the risk of, of it doesn't mean you're going to run into it every time, but it means you're more likely to. What I'm going to show you doesn't prevent you from having internal reflections. It just reduces the likelihood that you will. What I suggest you do is buy a set of step down rings. They come in a set of, I think it's nine down and eight up, where you, where you get every ring you're ever going to need. The reason I recommend them is they actually have a 26 millimeter um, filter size at their last piece. The smallest piece in the set is a 26 millimeter right at the end. And it has the right thread, right? It has a very close thread. It's 0.75 the objective seats nicely into it. Now, by then using the next four size step down rings, you end up with 52 millimeters at the bottom one, which is actually what this ring is. It's 52 and jumped to 77. If all you had was that stack of step down rings, you could just keep going stepwise. You'd end up with a little pyramid of, of step rings and that's fine. This is the infinity space. I'm using a crop sensor camera. With this lens and that camera, I am not gonna get vignetting. I'm gonna be able to get a, a complete full sensor. I would have to increase the infinity space or the space between the objective and the lens a lot more than that to get vignetting. Just to let you know, if you're using a full frame camera, that might not be the case. Um, especially if you're using a full frame camera, extension tubes and a Raynox, you are going to have vignetting. But again, go to one of the other videos for that. So once you've assembled something that goes in a 77 and has an M26 at the end or a 26 millimeter at the end, just screw the adapters on, make sure it's seated nicely, but, but not too terribly tight. Then you're ready to put your objective on. A moment of silence for these are just such superb pieces of engineering just superb if you clean your objective I've or, I already cleaned this before I put it in the box but use a clean uh, microfiber cloth and be gentle be very very gentle and I already warned you about dropping these this is this is one that I'll use two hands to, to put it in.
All right, once it catches the thread, screw it all the way home. This is well supported with a good center of gravity. That's not going to sag. This is going to work fine. So that is the camera set up and you've got your lens set correctly. Yeah, you know that your step length is going to be, say, 20 or 25 microns. Uh, and uh, you've watched my video, so you know how to use this device to move that small of a distance. One of the cardinal principles of using a microscope objective as a camera lens is you need to set up your system so that you never touch the camera, you never touch the base, you never touch anything. When I'm doing this, I, I have a smaller room that I go in that has a, a floor that doesn't shake and I set everything up and I start a stack and I leave the room. I don't even want air movement in the room because it makes a difference. Okay, so just bear that in mind. To avoid any kind of vibration when you're taking your actual photographs, you want to put your camera in mirror up mode or silent shooting mode. Whatever mode your camera has where it doesn't make any noise and doesn't, you don't hear a lot of clicking and clacking while it's going on. With DSLRs, mirror up mode is what we call it. Turn your dial to mirror up. That means when you fire the shutter the first time, the mirror flips up. You wait for a second or two for any vibration to die down. Then you press the button a second time and the shutter fires. Now, if you're doing that, you can also set up your trigger to where it only fires the flash on the second press. But you will need a trigger. If you don't have a trigger, you can use cables like a PC sync cable or something like that. This is much easier, much easier. What we need, by the way, it, auto focus is off on your camera. Auto everything is off. Don't have auto anything on. It'll just mess you up. Now we need to get our specimen up in front of this objective and at the right distance and the right height. Many different ways you can do that. From bendy arms with clamps, with microscope objectives, unless I have a, a significant weight on this thing, or it's a sh very short bendy arm, I tend not to use them. Instead, I'll use something like a lab lifter. A lab lifter, if we look underneath its skirt, is just one of these metal platforms with a screw on the end. It's simply for moving things up off the table. You'll see that when I'm using microscope objectives, every piece of metal, including the objective, is wrapped in something black. I don't want a reflective surface anywhere in the room, literally anywhere in the room. So anything that's shiny gets covered up inside the, the assembly and out. So this is permanently uh, got a piece of felt over it that just prevents it from reflecting light. And this allows me to move it up and down uh, easily and quickly to the height that I want. Now, if you don't want to invest in one of those, I found these blocks of wood at a thrift shop. They're apparently a game. Yeah, okay, I don't know what kind of game it would be with pieces of wood like this. Maybe you have to see how many you can get in your nose. That's what my son would have done. Um, Something like this, a dollar's worth of these was an enormous bag full. What I did was I, I just wrapped them all in sticky felt to make them black. And you can pile these things up and put your specimen on top and they'll hold it rock steady. Use your imagination. It doesn't matter. Just bear in mind, reflective surfaces are going to come back and bite you. If not all the time, they will eventually. So how you get the specimen up there is up to you. I'm going to throw in a top tip for people who are already doing this stuff and, uh, and for whom this video is very boring and they're probably not watching, but I'm still going to do this. This is something that I invented the other day out of necessity. I was photographing something and uh, I, I had uh, diffusers on all my flashes, but I wasn't quite getting 
the drop off of the light that I wanted. And I wanted another layer of diffusion. Normally I use a big sheet of tracing paper over the top that is held up on a stick. I broke my stick the other day. So I had to come up with another way. And this is what I came up with. And it's really, really good for when you need extra diffusion. It's a little piece of plastic that, that it was actually a power a uh, power brick or something that was broken and I took it apart. It's just a little piece of plastic and I've stuck a piece of tracing paper to it using Gorilla Tape, like so, to make a little tent that has a cutout in front. And what I do is <clears throat> I take this to my insect preparation area. It's kind of like they do in electron microscopy. You prepare your specimen somewhere else and then you put the whole cassette into the microscope. Well, that's what gave me the idea to do this. Uh, so I'll, I'll be at my prep area and I'll get my insect ready and I'll get it positioned usually on a little ball of blue tack. And then I just reach in and stick the blue tack to the bottom of the plastic and it holds perfectly well right in the center of my uh, tent. And then all I have to do is, uh, I had some magnets on it at one time, but it was hard to get it off. Uh, just position it right over the end of the objective, like so. And it is fantastic. Uh, I cannot describe what a good job it does. It's like a tubular ping pong ball. I should patent this. Bit late now, isn't it? All right, so our specimen's taken care of. So you're all good to go. But as soon as you start taking pictures, you realize, whoops, no light. You need light. I'm going to suggest you use flash, any speed lights that you have. If you have the luxury of having a match set, like three Canon speed lights, fantastic. You can mix and match. I just don't recommend it because between different brands, even between different models, there can be a difference in the delay time, causing a very low power, the flashes to actually flash at different times, and the flash from one flash to be gone before the flash of the second appears. Remember that they're flashing at one thirty thousandth of a second or something like that. So if you can, get the same brand and have a full set. Those of you who followed the channel know that I normally use what's called a macro cage. Well, it's not actually, that's what I call it, the macro cage. It's, it's similar to this in that it's a bigger piece of wood and it has a, a cage of PVC around it from which you can hang lights and backdrops and things like that. Multiple videos on it. But it is being replaced by a modular space age metal cage that will be coming out soon and I'll be showing you how to build. But in the meantime, if you're gonna be using just a basic platform like this, you need to have a way to get your lights, your flashes around your subject. It is not good enough when you're using something as beautiful as this objective to stick two speed lights on either side and hope that that does it. No, sir, that will not do it. You need to be able to have your lights coming from the front and above, below, to the side, down under here. You need a way to position your speed lights so that for any given specimen, you're getting the light where it needs to be. Remember, you have the luxury of using one of the best objectives in the world that has 34 millimeters, 34 millimeters of working space. One of my other favorite lenses, the Nikon CFI Plan 10X, has a working space of about 10 and a half millimeters. This is three and a half times that. So you really can put all your flashes in and around here, but you need to have a way to attach them. I want to take a very brief detour to talk about small rig. They recently uh, revamped their whole operation. They now have a very big, um, very nice Amazon store and they have reworked a lot of their parts. I was looking for somebody to work with on the new cage project. Having been a, a long time uh, user of small rig, 
I got in touch with them and they were very eager to work with me. You'll see me in previous videos all the time using articulating arms to hold, to hold my flashes, to hold, uh, well, everything. If it needs to be held, it's, it's on a nine inch small rig articulating arm like this. I use these arms all day long every day. The only issue I've ever had with uh, the small rig devices is the pad on the plastic foot wear out and they tear off. Well, they have redesigned that feature and the new arm is night and day different. Instead of having a pad that uh, was on the, the plastic disc, they now have a metal disc, solid metal disc, with a, an inlaid rubber ring. These don't wear out, the rubber doesn't come off and they grip as firmly after a hundred uses as they do the day you put them together. Every now and again, I'm holding something heavier and this new clamp from Small Rig is one of the coolest things I have seen this year and every, all the tightening points have holes in them so that you can stick an Allen wrench in there and give it a good extra crank. But it, when I completely upgrade, I'm going to all of these um, and will probably daisy chain a couple of them so that I can get a little bit more height. But if I open my clamp up all the way, it fits right under the edge of the lower wooden uh, mount and then I can tighten it down. That's what those grooves are on the other side. Once that's tight, I position my light exactly where I want it, tighten down on that, and that is not going anywhere. So this is how you need to attach your lights. If you need more height, use a longer clamp. You know, if you're spending 400 and something dollars on that objective, you need to get yourself some decent lights and use the light because you now have a, an optic that is going to capture all of that nuance. If you're in the market for uh, a heavy duty quality bendy arm for, for your macro work, get one of these. You will not be disappointed and you won't be disappointed with the regular articulating arms. They're better than ever and the super clamps I now have at least 50 of the things. When I get ready to eat my supper in the evening and I'm preparing to put my napkin on, I, I secure it to my collar with uh, super clamps on, on each side. I don't, I don't do that. I'm gonna be working with Small Rig on the cage project when I told them that I was gonna be talking to you guys about some of their newer clamps today. Uh, they asked me to pass on a, a discount um, link, and that will be in the show notes. If, if you have any plans for upgrading any of your articulating arms in the future, definitely, definitely check out the uh, small rig clamps, especially while you can get this discount. And that'll be in the show notes down below. They have the best cold shoes uh, for holding the flashes. The ones that small rig has actually lock the the flash into the shoe. I am trying to convince Small Rig that they need to get into macro photography in a big way. There are so many of these things that we use that really nobody else uses, and there is nobody that caters to to the macro photographer. If we had a company that was as big into quality uh, and price as Small Rig that was building the stuff we need, the world would be a better place. Talking about being a better place, if you're using flash and you're planning on doing deep stacks, make sure that at the beginning of every shoot, you have your Godox battery charged if you're using the V series flashes that use a battery pack. If you're using the ones that use cells, use the Eneloop Pro. Uh, they're the only ones that will get you through a 200 shot stack. If you are new to focus stacking and you've never used flash to focus stack, let me give you a warning. This is specifically for Godox flashes, but the, it, it goes for any flashes. I just can't give you the exact times, but these flashes overheat. 
if you fire them too many times in succession without a long enough cooling gap, they will shut down, thermally shut down until they're cool. I have discovered that if you have 15 and one half seconds between shots, they do not overheat. I've shot them over a thousand times at low power to test them and they never overheat at 15 and a half seconds. Just a word to the wise, if you're using a stack shot, set it up to 16 seconds, you'll never have a missed uh, flash. I think there's two other gadgets uh, that you're gonna want to have on hand. The first is um, a packet of inexpensive sticky on -y felt. This is kind of like a poor man's version of flocking material. I wouldn't flock with it. I wouldn't put this inside uh, any of your optical stuff, but for sticking onto shiny bits of metal around your specimen, fantastic. It, I, I have a felt collar that goes over the objective to keep the shiny surface hidden. The other thing you're gonna need is any kind of LED light. You're probably all familiar with the Janslo, I think it's called. My all-time favorite bendy arm LED light from uh, Ikea. And this gripper fits right on the side of my piece of wood so that when I am uh, shooting and I'm setting up my shot, I can put this on and see everything. I can see in live view you know, where my specimen is. I can get everything set up and then turn it off to do my, my, my shooting. So you need some kind of a lamp. You know, in my cage, I had a fluorescent light to do the same thing, but uh, without a cage, this does just as good a job. That's it. That's everything I have. That's all you need to know, everything you need to know to be able to use your brand new Mitu Toyo to focus stack. Jeff told me he has some left. He didn't elucidate on that. If you have never used an objective before, but you scored one of these Mitu Toyos, you're getting ready to have the time of your life. If you have any questions, ask me. And if you have recently emailed me, you'll know that my current turnaround time answering emails is over a week. You know, there is another place that you can ask questions too. If you can't get in touch with me because I'm too busy to answer my emails, go to our Discord group. I am offering you an open invitation. There'll be a, a, an invitation link in the show notes. Take that, join the group, and uh, all kinds of very, very talented photographers hang out over there. You can ask them anything you want. If, if they don't know, it'll eventually get back to me and I'll, I'll answer it if I know. Fantastic stuff coming up. I am reviewing a variable neutral density filter that KNF wanted me to have a look at. And uh, that's gonna be coming up later on this week. And that video will include a giveaway carbon fiber tripod, yes, and that magnetic filter set that I used a few months ago, the ND1000, as well as a UV filter and a circular polarizer, all in a magnetic do doohickey that magnetizes onto the front of your lens. Fantastic, I love both of those products, and two of you are going to win a prize next time, so don't miss that, don't miss that. All right, what's next? That's it. I'll see you in a few days with something else. If you want me to do this same video, only with a Raynox, say so in the show notes and I'll do it. Till I see you again, take care, stay safe and be well.